Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to everyone present here today. My name is Sahil Gulati. I'm the Applications Manager of Life Sciences at Amitek Gitan, and I would like to welcome you all to our Life Sciences webinar series. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I would briefly go through the question submission process. You can type in your questions in the questions panel of the GoToWebinar task window, which is shown on the right-hand side of the slide. They will try to answer all your questions immediately after the talk, depending on how much time we have in our hands. If we do run out of time, then we will take the questions offline where answers to your questions will be sent by emails. Now with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. I welcome Alan Merck, who is an electron microscopist in the scientific group of Jana Oninovich at the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research at NIH. The team explores emerging platforms and develops methodologies for single particle analyses and cryo-electron tomography. A little bit of background on Alan. Alan graduated from Rutgers University with a degree in economics. He subsequently joined the lab of Shiram Subramaniam at the National Cancer Institute, where he learned the cryo-electron microscopy technique and was responsible for high-resolution data collection. Later, Alan joined Uninovich Group where his research interests include using cryo-electron microscopy technique to study signal transduction and regulation of gene expression. The title for today's talk is High Resolution with the Cryoarm K3 Combination, Cerulean Latitude and Future Data Collection Directions. And with that, I will leave the electronic podium to Alan. Thank you, Sahil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alan Merck, and I work at the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research. And today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of our work, our ongoing work uh, with high resolution data collection on the cryoarm K3 combo. So, just to give you a bit of a, beef, a brief background about myself, about what I did before I started working so closely with the cryoarm K3 here, is I used to work in Sherm Suminium's lab at the National Cancer Institute. And there we had all Thermo Fisher microscopes. And so we had a Titan Creos, we had two Polaris, we had a T12, and I collected a little bit on each one, but I mostly focused on, on the Titan Creos, and I was responsible for high resolution data collection there. And, uh, and one of the works that I was part of was uh, high resolution structure determination of beta gal. And here's some figures from a paper that we published in 2015, where we reported the 2.2 angstrom structure of beta gal. And 2.2 angstroms by single particle nowadays isn't too unusual, but, that, but, but back then, it was a really exciting result. So in Chairman's lab, again, we had all thermo Fisher microscopes. Those are the ones that I worked on, I was comfortable with, and you know, I was, uh, it was nice using those because if you knew how to work in Titan Creos, you could kind of find your way around a T12 to a large extent because all the software was so similar in a lot of ways. Um, but when I worked there and I would talk to different people that worked on Joel microscopes, I would always hear how different the Joel microscopes were. Uh, the software, the hand panels, even fundamentally the optics, I uh, was told, were different. So when I found out that I was going to be working on a cryo arm here at the Frederick National Lab, I was, you know, nervous, and I was saying to myself, okay, it could take a long time for me to learn this and, you know, how to learn the microscope to even operate it, and then potentially even longer to learn it to uh, collect high-resolution data on it, like I felt confident that I could do with uh, Thermo Fisher Scope. So here's a, a picture of our team at the Frederick National Lab. Uh, there's Jana in the middle, and uh, on her right is Reinhard Grishammer, and on her left is Joe Darling, and then there's me in the gray shirt. Uh, and when I got here, uh, you know, we started uh, getting ready to work on a Cryoarm 200, and the uh, the advisor to the National Cryoarm program here at the FNL was actually Shiron, and he was the one that thought it would be a good idea to get the Cryoarm. He was a, a believer in the Cryoarm. He was a big believer in the Colfax technology, and um, at that time when we were making these decisions, when Shiron was uh, advising this, this was after Gabe Lander had done a lot of his uh, high resolution work with the Talos Arctica at 200 kV. So we knew that 200 kV could be used for high resolution data collection. And Sharon thought, okay, if we have, you know, uh, Cryon 200, 200 kV or with the cold fed, with the Omega filter, with the K3 with its high frame rate, that that could be a package that could produce some amazing results. And, uh, and before Sharon went up to Vancouver full time to, 
you know, working on his biotech company and things up there. He had time to uh, collaborate with us on one paper, one project. And, uh, you know, because we were collaborating with Shiram, we thought it would be a good idea to, of course, work on BetaGal. And the goal was to use the, the package on the left here, the Cryom 200K3, to produce a density map beta gal that showed the type of features that you see uh, surrounding our team here on the right. So while we were waiting for the Cryarm 200 to get uh, delivered and eventually installed, uh, there was a post on Twitter by Takuki Kato reporting a very high resolution structure of apoferritin from Cryarm 300. Um, and just to give a bit of the numbers here, from the first 56 images alone, they were able to get a 1.76 angstrom map. And then eventually when they added in all the data from about one day of data collection with JADIS, it was 840 images from a little bit uh, less than 1,000 uh, starting uh, micrographs. When they added in all that data, they got the 1.54 angstrom structure. And, and this was a couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, nowadays 1.5 on uh, 1.5 angstrom megaferritin doesn't seem like too big of a deal. Uh, but back then it was a groundbreaking result. And, you know, it was just the highest resolution ever actually by single particle cryom at that time. Um, and when we saw this result, I mean, we were already excited to get the cryom 200. But when we saw this result, we got even more excited and, you know, about what we could do with, you know, some more samples, hopefully getting to, you know, uh, high resolution as well. And one of the things that we took notice of when we were uh, hearing about this data set right here is that when they analyzed the data, they noticed that there was a changing in beam tilt over time during the course of data collection. And when they analyzed it in detail, they eventually were able to determine that each time they changed the objective lens setting, there was a change in the beam tilt. So, and with apoferritin, you have, you know, it's a, there's a lot of advantages of working with apoferritin, especially for something like this, where if the beam tilt estimation is not perfect because you have the high symmetry of apoferritin, you could potentially uh, overcome it just by sheer numbers to a certain extent. And then obviously with apoferritin, you have the advantage that you can have a high particle density on a micrograph level and then, you know, have that extra signal to be able to estimate the beam tilt. And, you know, so for apoferritin, you could potentially get around this to a certain extent. Whereas with other samples, it may not be a possibility. Um, and so for us, we thought, okay, this, we have to find a way to work around this so that it could be more robust to more samples and to make sure that we'd be okay, no matter what sample we worked on. So the easiest way we thought to get around this was to just simply avoid it by just leaving the objective lens setting constant throughout the course of the data collection session and using the stage to achieve whatever desire to focus we want. And we knew that there was some practical potential practical problems with this as far as uh, achieving whatever desire to focus we want uh, and how long it would take to get to that desire to focus by moving the stage. And then also um, maybe having some drift problems because you're moving the stage more than you normally would. So we weren't quite sure how it was going to perform, um, but we wanted to give it a shot and you know we wanted to see how it would do. And lucky for us at that time, we had a Joel Applications Engineer stationed in a lab with us named Taku Fukumura. And when we talked to him about this, he was uh, confident that he could script all this in in serial EM and that it would work properly and that uh, we wouldn't have huge, you know, bad effects on our data quality or our data throughput. So he was confident that everything would be okay. So eventually when we got the Cryoarm 200 installed and we collected, uh, you know, one of our first data sets, essentially our first real data set on the Cryoarm 200, we got a 1.8 angstrom structure of beta gal. And shown here on the right is a picture from Coot. Uh, a screenshot of some of the types of density features we were seeing. And so going back to one of the, the early data set that I collected in Sherman's lab at 2.2 angstrom resolution, that raw data was eventually deposited at Empire. And, you know, people from around the field uh, downloaded it, uh, you know, played around with it and, you know, pushed the resolution, things like that. So even though the original structure is at 2.2, eventually people were able to push it past two. There were several groups, including our own, that was able to push the resolution to 1.9 angstroms. Um, so here for the cryoarm data, the first data set here, it went to 1.8 angstrom. So it was already beyond anything we'd ever done uh, with beta gal before. So it was a, a really cool result. So again, just to give a little bit more of a comparison here to what was done before. So this is a comparison between the 2020 structure from the cryoarm and the 2015 structure, the original structure that was published uh, six years ago. And the, the difference is very clear between the two maps. So this is just actually taking the same figures that were done for the old structure and redoing them for the new paper. And uh, you can already see in the, so this is now a 2.2 versus 1.0 angstrom difference. So it's a 0 0.4 angstrom improvement. And you can see that you can see better definition for holes and rings. You can see that there's less noise in the new map. And you can also see that the, the density hugs the model almost perfectly with the small exception of 
there are some protrusions in the density for the 2020 map uh, coming near the atoms. Um, and when we started seeing this in the, the cryware map, we weren't exactly sure how to interpret it. We were, you know, we didn't want to overinterpret it. And we thought maybe at first it might be noise, but the noise in the map overall was very low. So we didn't think it was that. And then the more we looked at the map, we eventually realized that these density protrusions were actually uh, co uh, coinciding with the locations of hydrogen atoms. Um, and we were not the first ones to see these in the uh, cryo map. The first one actually to see it was uh, Dimitri Lumkus when he, he got a 1.86 angstrom structure of the adeno associated virus published a couple of years before. He was the first one to see the hydrogen. So when we saw it too, we were like, okay, this is uh, what it is. And, uh, you know, it was unexpected because in x-ray, you don't see the density for the hydrogens until you're at much higher resolution. Um, but, you know, Dimitri, when he saw it, it was really surprising. And for us, it was just kind of confirmation that, okay, this is what it is. So being able to see the uh, density for the hydrogens, you know, it's a very nice technical feat, but the question is, what's the practical benefit of this in, in real life when you go to model building? So uh, here's an example of that, showing how the density for the hydrogens helps you in fitting of glutamines, asparagines, and threonines. So shown on the far left is just the density for the glutamines and asparagines. And you can already see with just the density alone, the asymmetry in the appearance of density a little bit, especially for the glutamine. And then if you try to fit in the incorrect rotomer, you can see that there's clearly a mismatch between the model and the map. And then if you flip it, and you, you fit the amide the other way, you can then see that the model and the, the, the map coincide quite nicely. So this was, for me, the first time ever dealing with a, a map at, at the point where you can see hydrogens, but um, this problem of fitting the amide is a well-known problem in uh, structural biology called the NQ problem. And you know people have been thinking about this for a long time because in, in X-ray, where you don't have density for the hydrogens, the density for the nitrogens and the oxygen is essentially indistinguishable. So you kind of just have to go on the chemical environment around the side chain. Um, whereas here in cryo, you can just fit it based merely on visual inspection. Um, but in uh, X-ray, they have these different programs that are specifically designed to go in and find NQ rotomers that are fitted incorrectly and flip them. And it's estimated that about 20% are fitted incorrectly. Um, but again, here in cryo, at least for these side chains right here, with the hydrogen density, you can fit them just based merely on visual inspection. And there's really no ambiguity about fitting them. And similarly for the three name side chain on the right, you can see that uh, that one's pretty clear which way to fit it as well. So just to give a, a, a broader view of the 1.8 angstrom beta gal map, here is an amino acid panel showing uh, each of the 20 amino acids. And now that the hydrogens are added into the model for all the side chains, now, now it's pretty clear that these density bumps correspond to the locations of hydrogen atoms. Um, so we were really happy about this result. It was nice to be able to do this on the Cryom 200. Um, and I, you know, people were, I think were in the field were happy that the Quarum 200 could produce such a result. But, you know, right away we were getting uh, questions from people in the field. The, uh, and some of these questions are listed on the bottom right. So uh, the most common question we were getting, or the, maybe the first question we were getting was, okay, uh, 1.8 angstroms is great, uh, but how about higher resolution? Can it go higher? So, you know, 1.8 angstroms wasn't the highest resolution at that time. It wasn't even as high, obviously, as the 1.54 angstrom apophyrin structure I mentioned earlier. So people were happy that it was 1.8, but uh, you know, people's first question was always, can it go higher? Um, another common question that we were getting was the prospects for a tilted data collection on the cryo with K3. And so tilted data collection, obviously you could need if you have a preferred orientation problem with the particle, and obviously if you wanted to do uh, tomography data collection. So uh, especially for the way that we collected this uh, data set for Betagal using the stage, uh, for autofocusing, there was a question of how the microscope would perform if you wanted to combine that with any kind of tilted data collection. So that was another uh, common question that people had. And then uh, another common question that people had was, okay, you, you got to 1.8 angstroms on beta-gal, which was very, very nice, but this is a kind of a benchmarking protein. Um, and beta-gal has been done at high resolution before, both by X-ray, uh, both by cryo and by X-ray. So people wanted to know how this whole uh, system here would perform if you had a more a challenging biologically relevant sample, you know, and what they what they really meant was, you know, how would this microscope perform on my sample? Um, so that's what people were thinking. They wanted to know the answer to this question. That was their, you know, one of their questions. So Yana said, okay, if we wanted something that's biologically relevant and that people can kind of relate to, uh, what better sample to do than the ribosome? So uh, Yana decided that, okay, let's do the ribosome. And in fact, let's do the human ribosome. You know, that's the, you know, the most complicated one. And so she purified the human ribosome from HeLa cells. 
And shown here in the upper uh, left of this slide right here is a, a micrograph, a picture taken with the K3, where you can see these ADS particles and you can see the, the strands going through, which were mRNA trapped inside the ribosome at the time of freezing. And Yana was able to get this structure to 2.1x in resolution. Um, and this is a, a 2.1x in resolution for the overall ADS particle. And, and so Yana said, okay, not only are we gonna do the ribosome, not only is it gonna be humid, but we're not gonna stall it in any way. So this is not fixed in any one particular state. It's the unstalled human ribosome kind of as it exists inside the cell with all of its uh, beautiful heterogeneity. Uh, so because of that, she had to use multi-body refinement and rely on to get to this kind of resolution. So shown in the bottom left is the map um, and you can actually see the, the transparent masks that she used to define the bodies from multi-body refinement. So she used one mask, uh, one body was the small subunit head domain, one body was a small subunit body slash platform domain, and then another body for the large subunit. So, uh, and this just kind of allows you to account obviously for the, the relative flexibility. Uh, so the overall resolution of the full ADS particle was at uh, 2.1 angstrom resolution. For the large subunit uh, by itself, the resolution went to two angstrom resolution, but then uh, for the local resolution, if you look at the, the, the colorful plot below the micrograph, you can see that in the core of the large subunit, the resolution extends solidly to 1.8 angstroms. So this put it essentially on par with what we had for beta gal. And just to, on the right, just to kind of give you a, a little bit better view of the type of features that you're seeing at 1.8 in the ribosome, just like in beta gal, you can see holes and rings, you can see water molecules, and you can even start to see some hints of the hydrogen bumps as well. So again, just to give you a bit more of a broad view of uh, the features that you're seeing in the ribosome, here's an amino acid panel, this one's in the ribosome. Again, very, very similar to beta gal. Um, and because it's a ribosome, not only do you have protein, but you have the RNA. So on the bottom right, you can see examples of uh, the density for the nucleotides. So uh, because it's a ribosome, you have not only the protein plus the RNA, but you also have a very intricate and very important solvent network. Um, so shown on the left here is some examples of the, the solvent structure inside the ribosome. Um, and the solvent structure has been known for a long time to be important, um, but because of you know, all different experiments that were done, uh, different metals at ions at different concentrations, it's, they know that they're important, but they don't quite understand the details of it. Um, and it's hard to kind of come up with a coherent explanation for what's going on in there as far as why this ion is important here or that, uh, that metal is important there. Um, and one of the, the reasons that it's hard to come up with a coherent explanation is that they don't know exactly where they're positioned. Um, so really a high resolution structure was needed here to be able to, in order to be able to position these things and to better able to interpret the studies that have been done for a long, long time. And especially magnesium, that one's probably the one that's been studied the longest and the most. Um, so, but in order to really assign it properly, you need a high resolution structure. And there's a lot of ribosome structures that are deposited in the PDB, both from, from EM, from X-ray, and many of them have magnesiums or other um, th things assigned there as far as the metals go. But when people go in and, and analyze the deposited structures in detail, there are believed to be many misassignments, uh, both for the ribosome deposited PDBs and also you know, for a lot of other uh, PDBs. And this could you know, obviously be important for other enzymes or other nucleic acid systems as well. Uh, but certainly for the ribosome, um, it's believed that there are a lot to be learned by looking at these and really positioning them properly. Um, but in order to do that, we need a high resolution map. And the good thing about getting high resolution is that for some of these, they become pretty easy to identify. So for the magnesium, you have this strict octahedral uh, coordination going on where in a high resolution map, it's very easy to identify which uh, density corresponds to magnesium. So in the upper left panel here, you see a magnesium uh, coordinated by both RNA and pro uh, water molecules. And next to that, you have a nice uh, hexahydrated magnesium. Again, uh, very, very well defined. And in the bottom left panel, you have a one that's a, a bit more tricky. This one's a potassium ion. Um, so there's different ways to assign it. You can go based on a B factor. You can go based on the quality of the density. You try to go based on coordination distances, but it's not always clear. So for the one in the lower uh, left panel, panel C, that one, Yana was confident that that for sure was a potassium. But there was a lot of other situations where it wasn't clear whether it was a potassium or whether it was water. There's also um, potentially, depending upon the environment, you can confuse it with an ammonium ion. So there's a lot of um, questions here about how to assign these properties. So for this one, Yana was sure, but there's a lot of other ones where we need more information and it's not clear yet what we have to do to get it. And I'll talk a bit later about potential ways where this problem could be solved a bit. 
Um, shown next to that is a, a zinc ion. Those ones are pretty well characterized, and that one there is uh, between uh, four cysteine side chains. Because it's the ribosome, you have also, again, more heterogeneity, not just in uh, st structure and uh, conformational, but also compositional. And one of the ways that you have differences in the ribosome is with these post transcriptional modifications. And as you go to higher uh, organisms, you actually get more PTMs. So in the human ribosome, there's over 200 post transcriptional modifications. And here's a couple examples here showing what these PTMs look like inside the ribosome. And these are important for uh, translational fidelity and speed and uh, all those types of things. So not only do you have post transcriptional modifications, but you also have post translational modifications. And shown here are a couple that Jana highlighted as particularly interesting. So the one in the middle is a backbone modification where an uh, aspartate has been modified to an isoaspartate. And this modification had been known for decades to exist in the E. coli ribosome, although people did not know exactly where the, the isoaspartate was positioned. And then last year, Jamie Cates' group published a paper in eLife, uh, a two-angstrom structure of the E. coli ribosome, where they were finally able to pin down exactly where this isoaspartate is. And then when they looked at the model they had, and they looked, they compared it to different things going on in higher organisms, they hypothesized that this isoaspartate that was known to exist in the E. coli ribosome also exists in higher organisms. And shown here on the left is a figure from that paper, Watson et al. published in eLife last year, where they have the deposited model from a eukaryotic uh, ribosome, and they then switch it to an isoaspartate, and they say that the model for the isoaspartate fits better than having the encoded aspartate. And then when Yana looked at it in the, the high resolution map of the human ribosome that, that she was able to um, do, indeed that the there the isoaspartate fits much better with the density. So it does indeed appear that this isoaspartate is conserved from E. coli all the way to human. Um, an additional modification, post transition modification is here. This one's a side chain modification, the one that people are, are more commonly used to seeing. So this is a histidine methylation. This is another post translational modification that was known to exist in other ribosomes. This one was known to exist in yeast for a long time, but no one had any evidence yet that it existed in a human ribosome. And when Yana went in and looked at her map, she saw this extra density for the histidine and she thought, okay, this must be a methylation. And she tried different things with mass spec to confirm that it indeed was there. And it was a bit tricky as far as getting suitable peptides for mass spec analysis. And while she was doing all this work, there was actually a paper published in NAR where they had uh, one of the uh, conclusions of the paper was that they had mass spec confirmatory evidence that this modification does indeed exist. But it took a little bit of work, a little bit of trial and error, uh, choosing the right protease, those types of things. So the interesting thing about cryo, I mean, we can see the density here. We know it's there. We now understand the chemistry that's involved. But for certain situations, the mass spec is not so straightforward. And you need to, to work at it a little bit and you know devote a lot of resources to it before you actually for sure get the right answer. So with the cryo maps where you have this unbiased map and you can see this extra density here, it can kind of direct your, your potentially some people's research as far as putting the resources in, believing that it's there. Whereas if you're just going in blind, you may not be willing to devote the resources there. So uh, various viruses um, uh, employ strategies where they try to shut down the host translation system. Um, you know, they've evolved these over time. There's many uh, potential benefits from this if the virus is able to do this. One is that you shut down the host immune response that would normally um, hurt the virus. And also, if the virus is able to shut down the host translation system as far as translating host proteins, the, those resources can then be used to translate viral proteins. And nowadays, no virus more famous than SARS-CoV-2. And shown here is one of these uh, parts of SARS-CoV-2 that actually is part of this strategy. So, this is a non, the, the protein is non structural protein one, NSB1. And this has been characterized structurally a couple of times before by various different groups, both by X ray and cryo. And Yana thought, okay, let's see what we can add to the story here. Let's see if, if we can understand the system, understand this protein better, and potentially have something actionable for antiviral drug design. So the protein is shown, the schematic is shown in the, the left part in purple. And you can see that there's this N-terminal kind of globular domain, and then there's this flexible loop, and then there's these C-terminal helices. So the N-terminal domain has been determined by X-ray by a couple of different groups. The C-terminal helices have been done by cryo uh, by several different groups as well. And the way the C-terminal helices work is that they plug into the mRNA channel and they prevent 
cellular mRNA from getting loaded onto the ribosome and eventually getting translated. So this structure has been done by cryo, the C-terminal helices bound to the 40S by a couple of different groups on the 2.5 to 3 angstrom range. And what Yana is showing here is a 2 angstrom structure of this complex, the 40S bound to the NSP1. And in order to get this, she actually employed, again, multivitamin refinement, but this time instead of three bodies, now it's only the 40S, so it's only two bodies, one for the head, one for the body. And again, uh, it, the overall resolution went to two, and actually each body, both the head and the body, went to two angstrom resolution. And then locally, again, it's not shown here, but the local resolution, again, extends to about 1.8. So again, it's on par with what we had for a beta gallon for the ADS ribosome. So the interesting thing about this structure here is that now that you have the structure at high resolution, you're starting to see new features which could potentially be actionable um, for structure-based drug design. So shown in the middle panel is the NSP1 in gray bound to the 40S ribosome in yellow. And what we can actually see in the new model is a bunch of waters decorating the interface between NSP1 and the 40S. So you have, and this is to be expected, uh, that there's all these waters there. So you have waters between NSP1 and the ribosome. You can have several waters within NSP itself. So in the upper right-hand panel, you see again the NSP in gray. You see this water between the two helices. It kind of bridges the two helices. And then even bound to that water, there's several other waters that are hydrogen bonded to it that somehow add uh, structural stability to this complex and allow it to bind to the ribosome. And perhaps the most interesting water is this water that exists at the hotspot of the interaction between NSP1 and the ribosome. So shown in the, the lower right-hand panel is this known KH motif in the NSP1, which is conserved even going back to SARS-CoV-1 20 years ago, regular SARS. This KH motif existed back then, and it was the hot spot of the interaction between NSP1 and the ribosome. So if you mutate these two residues, this lysine, this histidine, then NSP1 no longer binds to the ribosome. So looking at this interaction here, it was known that you know, the lysine and the histidine positively charged would interact with the negatively charged backbone of the RNA. But it turns out that there's also a water hidden in there. So the lysine is actually hydrogen bonded to the water, and the water uh, is hydrogen bonded to the RNA around it. So that's the structure when NSP1 is bound. If you look at the structure of the 40S when NSP1 is not bound, that same water is there. But in addition to that one, there's also a water that's in the same position as the nitrogen of the lysine. So the way NSP1 works is it comes in, there's two waters there, it displaces the first water, and then it latches onto the second water. So all this detailed chemical information could potentially be you know, integrated and then somehow used to design uh, an antiviral drug that would hopefully help fight this virus. So all the, uh, the structures I've shown so far were all from data collected with Cerulean. And shown here on the left is a screenshot of Cerulean running on the cryo arm. And for people that have collected data with Cerulean before, this will look very familiar, I assume. And so this has been running on the cryo arm for a while. This was all set up by Taku Fukumura and shown on the right is a picture of me and Taku in front of the microscope. We're both smiling, so we obviously collected some nice data that day. And I would say Taku is my sensei on the microscope. He's the one that taught me how to use the cryo arm for high resolution data collection. And so he you know, teaches me things about the microscope, if something weird happens, what to do, and even just the basics of the microscope, the fundamentals, I always ask him questions. And he helps me out a lot, he taught me a lot. But the way that he helped me the most is actually by having this program right here, Surely M, be so user friendly and just so fast to learn. And he is constantly improving it, constantly adding new features in, constantly making it more streamlined. But even as it exists right now, especially if anybody has experience in Surely M on other scopes, it should be very easy to use and very uh, fast to learn. So, so me and uh, Taku, we always talk about, again, I, he teaches me about the microscope, but we also talk about what things we have to do to get better as far as improving data quality and hopefully getting to higher resolution. And, uh, you know, we talk about different things with uh, data collection settings, different things with the camera, the frame rate, you know, correlated double sampling mode, um, different things in the room as far as sound coming, how to make sure that the room is as quiet as possible to make sure that that's not any kind of resolution limiting factor. So we always talk about how to get the data better. And our goal was to take the 1.8 and make it better, collect new data, and hopefully answer that question that people ask about whether 1.8 angstroms is the limit for this microscope. And I'm happy to report that 1.8 angstroms is not the limit for this microscope. Shown here is a 1.6 angstrom structure of beta gal that we obtained from new data collected here on the Quirom 200. And I'll just play a movie here to get a better view of it. So, and probably the, the 
The most noticeable new feature at 1.6 instead of 1.8 is that you can start to see the second hole in the tryptophan, which you can see in the top left. And you can also start to see some better density for the hydrogens. And then the bottom left, you can start to see some, uh, some of the metals there in, in the beta gal. And also on the right, you can see this tyrosine with the uh, hydrogen from the hydroxyl. These hydrogens that are not fixed relative to their parent atoms were very almost impossible to see at 1.8 angstroms. Now at 1.6, we can start to see them a bit better. So beta gal, again, originally is 1.8, new data, we now have it at 1.6. But again, this is still beta gal, so people are always going to ask the question, how will this perform on my sample? So Yana said, okay, I think we can do better on the ribosome. So she prepared a new ribosome sample. This time, the human ribosome bound to the drug almost a taxine, which is an FDA-approved drug used to treat patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. And now, and now it's just a large subunit because that's the almost a taxing binds to the A site of the large subunit. And now the resolution is at 1.7 angstroms for the large subunit. So comparing that to the, to the previous uh, structure of the ADS, there the large subunit went to two angstroms. Here it's at 1.7. And if you look at the, the plot on the left where the map is colored by local resolution, even though the overall resolution of the large subunit goes to 1.7, in the core, the resolution extends actually almost to 1.5 angstroms. So you can see in the center, it's blue, that's 1.5. And then as you move radial outward, it's 1.6, 1.7, and the mentioning on the outside, it falls close to two. So the overall is 1.7, core goes to 1.5. Now for the drug, even though Yana added it in 100 times molar excess, she could see in the map that there was not full occupancy. So this was actually not the best part of that. So here's the, the drug density. It's not the best part of the map, but it's still sufficient to see holes and rings. If you look on the, the lower panel, you can actually start to see hydrogens on the drug itself, and you can start to see some of the surrounding environment, detailed chemical interactions. So again, not the best part of the map, but still good enough for in a lot of ways. Now, this structure had been done before. The first time the structure was done was by Tom Stites group, where they did the structure of almost a taxine bound to the archaeal ribosome. And there, Yana went in and she compared the model that she got here to the one that Tom Stites had for the archaeal ribosome, and there were key differences. So obviously in both cases, they bind to the A side of the large subunit, so mechanistically they worked the same, but the chemistry was different. There was different things with bases that had flipped in both, but they had flipped in different ways between the two. There was differences in the position of uh, metal ions. As you can see here, there's a potassium right down near the, near the drug, and that was actually in a very different position in the archaeal ribosome. So some very uh, key important differences between the human and the archaeal version that Yana picked up. So this right here is the drug density. And again, this was not the best parts of the map. This was not the, the part that extended close to 1.5. When we do go to that region, these are the types of features that we see. So this is in the core of the uh, particle where the resolution extends to 1.52. And this is all estimated by Relyon. And uh, 1.52, just to kind of give a comparison, that 1.54 angstroms is the average carbon-carbon bond distance. So you're, you know, we're far from atomic resolution on, on the whole, but we're getting close to the point where you can start to see some bumps for atoms. And shown here in the upper left panel, you can see some uh, RNA and protein. And around the histidine, if, you know, you can almost start to see that uh, there's slightly larger density for the nitrogens than there is for the carbons. And then if you look at the upper middle panel, you can see a proline and an arginine. These become very easy to model for these two particular residues. At this resolution, you just follow the atom trace along. And then for the upper right panel, things start to get a little bit tricky. So you see this. 2 prime O methylation on the guanosine right there, where you see this dumbbell-shaped density for the methylation. So that's good. And we knew that that uh, modification existed already. That was already confirmed by mass spec. Yana already had that in the model. So she knew that, that was going to be there. So it's a good check that, okay, it works. And if you compare that to the density to the left of it, where you see this protruding density coming off the model, that right there, we believe, is for a hydrogen. And you can see the difference in character of the densities, where the hydrogen density comes more to a point and the density for the methyl has more of a dumbbell shape. So that's a good check. The problem is in the ribosome, not all of the post-transcription modifications are fully uh, stoichiometric. So there's many sub-stoichiometric modifications in the ribosome. So if you did have a sub-stoichiometric modification, there's the possibility that it would look more like the hydrogen density. So you still do have to factor in the mass spec data and a lot of different pieces of information to integrate before you identify what you're seeing. But for ones like the dumbbell shape, you, know, you can be pretty confident that it's methylation. And then similarly for the panel on the bottom in the middle, you can see a nice methylation on this uh, cytosine. 
And then on the far left on the bottom, this is that same histidine that was shown earlier with the methylation. Now it's in the high resolution map. So now it's even more clear than, than before that it must be a methylation, even though the methyl is actually not there present in the model. You can see in the density that, okay, you again see how it gets larger out towards the metal, uh, methyl. So just to give a, again, a bit more view of the ribosome, here's ribosomal protein, you get a little rotisserie ribosome. Um, and then here you see some ribosome RNA. You see the ribosome RNA with uh, magnesium ions and waters as well. So 1.7 angstroms in the ribosome was nice, but Yana was not done yet. She wanted to say, okay, we are seeing some weird stuff with the hydrogens. Let's see if we can get more information by calculating difference maps, similar to what Shores and Takanori had done for their nature paper last year, where they, they, were, they used difference maps to pull out density for individual hydrogen atoms, both in 1.2 angstrom apoferritin and 1.7 angstrom GABA. So Yana said, okay, we're at 1.7 for the ribosome, so hopefully we'll be able to see them here. So she calculated these difference maps in CERVOCAT, and sure enough, these hydrogens popped out very nicely. The one on the top left is my favorite. That's where you can actually see the individual hydrogen atoms involved in Watson Crick base pairing. And it also looks nice if you look at the panel to the right of that, you see this tryptophan where you see much of the hydrogens around. And in the bottom left, you can see the hydrogens very nicely off along the RNA backbone. And the backbone hydrogens usually show up better. I guess they're more stable, um, but those ones look quite nice. And then in the bottom right, you see a bit of the hydrogen atoms along the uh, backbone, but also you see in the far right, you see an extra large density uh, peak. And that's actually for a post transcriptional modification that exists in the map, but it, didn't, it was not included in the model. So when you do the, the difference map, it shows up as larger. And it's also a good check to show that everything works. So you would expect that the density would be larger for the methyl than for just individual hydrogens. And that's exactly what you see here. So again, seeing now individual hydrogen densities is nice, but the question is, how can you use information to get a better model, which is always the final ultimate goal when you're doing any kind of structural biology, essentially. So shown here is two different situations where you see a very similar environment as far as you see these stacked purines and you see this spherical density that's kind of linking two and seven atoms of adjacent uh, purines. And if you were to just look at the, the FO map, just the, the blue mesh, it's very difficult to distinguish these two as far as whether they're a water or a potassium or potentially something else. So what Yana did was she looked at the difference maps here in these locations, and you could actually see that for the density on the left, you see these two hydrogen densities coming off the spherical density, coordinating, linking up with these two N7 atoms, which is indicative of a water, whereas the one on the right, there is no such difference map peaks, whereas for some of the hydrogens around on the nuclear bases, you can see that they're there. So, and in these two particular instances, if you look at the surrounding environment, you, you already know what they are. So this is why Yana chose these two. So if you look at the one on the left, you have this magnesium at the top of the figure. So that must be a water below it. That's uh, 2.1 axioms away. So it must be a water. And then for the one on the right, you have many coordinating ligands around that spherical density. It's not visible here, but there's many around it. So there you're also pretty sure that it must be a potassium and not a water. So these two were kind of ground truths that you knew already, but it shows how this type of information can be used potentially in situations where you don't have such information from the surrounding environment, where you can only go based on the density itself. And just to kind of give a, a wider view of uh, kind of the accumulation of all these new features that you're seeing at high resolution, here's ribbon representations of the large subunit and the small subunit of the ribosome, kind of as you would see in, in, a, in a paper that would be published. And then as you get to higher resolution, you start to see new features more reliably. So say at around three angstroms, you start to see some post uh, transcriptional modifications and uh, shown here in blue, and then also some metals shown in green. Then as you get to maybe 2.5 angstrom resolution, you can reliably model in a lot of the water molecules shown here in red. And then once you get to two angstroms, and especially with the difference maps, then you can start to actually see the, the locations of the hydrogen atoms. So it just kind of shows how these, uh, you know, the, the, these two things here are just really decorated with all this extra stuff that at first glance you may not even think would be important, but again, for the ribosome, it probably is. And there's a high resolution view of it. So after Yana was able to pull out these hydrogens with uh, in the ribosome, of course, we went back to beta gal and said, okay, can we do the same thing there? And sure enough, we could. So this is a uh, density from the 1.6 angstrom map kind of added on to the figure that was published in the paper for the 1.8 angstrom map. And now instead of just seeing this bulk density for the hydrogens, 
you're now able to see individual densities for each of the single hydrogens. So for the glutamine and for the asparagine, you can see the individual hydrogens. And now there's really no ambiguity about which way the immune should be fitted. And then on the right, they're actually, they're actually what's not a very nice density for the threonine methyl. So the one on the right is actually from a valine. So the map is not perfect. There was no methyl for a threonine there where you can see all three hydrogens very nicely. But you know, maybe when we get to high resolution, we could, but for the one on the right, it's actually from a valine. And I'll talk about the valines a little bit more in the next slide. So here's a bit more of a view of beta gal shown on the upper left is an alanine from a side view. And then to the right of that is the same residue from the top view. So you can see that you see individual density for the hydrogens. They're a little bit further away from the parent atom than the actual position. And that's to be expected. There was a, a very detailed description of this by Gary Mershadov in the uh, shorts paper. Shown in the top right is another example of a hydrogen where it's not fixed relative to its parent atom. So you have the hydrogen there on the hydroxyl, which is hydrogen bonded to the backbone carbon neob and adjacent protein segment. So you see that hydrogen atom very clearly, along with some of the ones along the ring of the tyrosine. In the bottom right, it's just a, a nice view with two leucines next to each other where you can see many of the hydrogens. They're really decorated all around these side chains. And then the one on the right is particularly interesting and particularly challenging. So in these maps, we often see situations where the beta carbon hydrogen is larger even in the FO map. And even in the difference map, we see larger density there. And we're not always sure how to interpret that. So especially before we started doing the difference maps, when we would see this large density there for the beta carbon hydrogen, we weren't sure if it was just very nice hydrogen density or some indication of alternate conformation for that side chain. And we see this here, it's shown with valines, but we also see with threonines, even cysteine, a lot of the small ones, especially. And we're not 100% sure how to interpret it. But if you look at the, the environment here, it seems likely that for the valine on the left, it's one conformation and that the density coming off the beta carbon hydrogen is for the hydrogen and for the one on the right, it seems more indicative that that may be some alternate conformation, so especially since that's the only hydrogen you see there on the side chain and it's larger. So, you know, maybe over time we'll be able to pick up on some patterns here about exactly how to interpret this. But, the, and you know, I would always hear from people in X-ray that things get more challenging as you get to higher resolution with alternate conformation for side chains. And it certainly seems like uh, that is indeed the case. So I'd like to close my presentation by giving a very brief update on Latitude S. So as I mentioned earlier, all, all of our data has been collected with Sierra Leone so far, but we are working on Latitude. And shown here is a, a picture that, you know, with Latitude running a bit on our chiral microscope, it's almost ready for prime time. It's not quite there, but it's very, very close to being ready. And I expect it, it will be ready soon. So all this work in getting Latitude set up was actually done by Augustine all during COVID. So this was all done by him remotely and him and the Gatant team working together. But Augustine actually never got here in person for this. It was all done remotely, working on the cryoworm, getting, you know, getting past uh, various issues. And it's able to collect data now. It's missing a few bits and pieces that make it you know, faster and better and those types of things. But it's almost ready for prime time. So for the people out there who enjoy collecting data with latitude and they've done it on other microscopes and looking forward to collecting data on the cryoworm with latitude, it's very close and I expect that it'll be ready very soon. So I'd like to close my presentation by thanking everyone involved, my team here, my boss, Yana Ogdenovich, uh, Ryan Hargrishammer, Joe Darling, and Bernard Hyman, who is not part of the team yet. He'll join our team in December, and that's him pictured on the right uh, above all of us, uh, in the, kind of in the background. He'll join our team in December. He's an image processing specialist. He's a developer of BSoft, and I know for, for me personally, I'm really looking forward to working with him and learning from him. Hopefully, we can all together push past 1.6 angstrom resolution. Um, and also, Yana is uh, currently recruiting. So if you have an interest in the ribosome, especially high resolution stuff, especially where we're able to see the hydrogens and that kind of thing interests you, reach out. I think that she'll have a job posting probably soon, maybe on our Twitter page. So if you have an interest in the ribosome high resolution, uh, definitely reach out. Maybe we can work together and do some fun stuff. Uh, another huge thank you to Taka Fukumura. Like I say, he's my sensei and he's the one that set up Serial EM. Serial EM is now officially offered as a product by Joel, as I understand it. So all these scripts are going out to people and people are using them. And again, for me, it's just very nice to work with someone who had no previous experience with Joel microscopes. And I sat down, he had everything set up for me and it's a very, um, very user-friendly environment to work in. A big shout out to Shiram and Shing from UBC. As I mentioned earlier, Shiram is now up in Vancouver full-time, working on his biotech company. And thank you to them for the collaboration on the 1.8 angstrom beta gauss structure. And thank you to Augustine from Gatan. Again, he logged in remotely many times uh, during COVID, never got to go out here in person. It was very inconvenient for him to work that way, but he, he fought through it and him and the Gatan team have latitude where it's almost ready for people to use. And with that, uh, I'd like to open up to questions.
Thank you, Alan. It was a beautiful talk uh, with a lot of implications for drug discovery. Now, before we go to questions again, I uh, would like to remind the audience again to please submit your questions by typing into the question panel of the GoToWebinar task window, again, shown on the right of the slide. And we have the first question, Alan. Um, so could you please repeat what is the reason for using the stage for focusing on CryoArm 200? Is that a feature of CryoArm 200 or is it also present for ARM 300? What is the typical resolution that can be routinely achieved on CryoArm 200 plus K3 in single particle? So it seems like there are two questions within that question. Sure, so uh, the first one first is that that uh, feature as far as changing the, the beam tilt changing with a change in the setting of the objective lens, that was actually discovered on the CryoArm 300. I'm not sure about the regular arm, um, but I know it exists on the CryoArm 300 anyway. And for that reason, if you just leave the objective lens setting unchanged during the course data collection, then you won't have to worry about that problem. And also if you have the ability, and a lot of people think they do probably, that you can estimate the beam tilt per micrograph, then you won't have to worry about it. We haven't gone that far quite yet, so we always use the stage for focusing, but uh, that's the reason that you'll have a change in beam tilt each time you change the focus. And then, oh, I'm sorry, for the, the second question, the achievable resolution, uh, I'm sorry, the question was about the average. Yeah, what's the typical resolution that can be routinely achieved with the combination of prior arm and A3 in single particle? I, I think that two angstroms is not out of the question. It's just I mean, higher, I, I would say. It's just a matter of the sample prep. So we haven't done an eight before, and obviously that's an easy one, but the, I think the only limitation is the sample as far as I can tell. So the sky's the limit. Just the sample's gotta be done right, and then you should be able to achieve 1.6, 1.7. Thank you, Alan. So we have a question about evil sphere correction. How much difference in resolution evil sphere correction can result in for typical protein samples? That's a good question. So for uh, beta gal, we don't see much of an improvement, hardly at all. And, th and then for the ribosome, we see a little bit more than 0.05, maybe 0.06 on average about there. Um, it does not matter as much as I thought that it would, but this could be because the evil sphere correction is not implemented in CTF refinement. And that's something that's done in the program M, and that's something that we'll be trying soon. So as of right now, just slightly more than 0.05 angstroms. Great. So there's another question. How do you feel the CryoArm 200-300 systems are in terms of servicing and maintenance, especially in comparison to Creo's and Octaga systems? The, the, the service you're saying? Yes. Uh, how is the CryoArm system in terms of servicing and maintenance and in comparison with Creo's and Octaga systems? Uh, I, I guess they're a little different. So I know that Joel recommends two uh, PMs per year, whereas Thermo recommends one. We actually don't do two, we only do one. And we haven't had um, many problems with the microscope. We had one issue with the stage that was resolved pretty quickly once the, the drone engineers got in here. And then we had one issue with uh, the water, which was actually an issue with our room here where we always had the lights on and then uh, we had an issue with the water, but that, that was fixed pretty quickly. So the, the microscope seems pretty robust, you know, the, the column itself and also even the loader we've never lost any kind of cartridge or anything like that so but um there there is differences as far as uh you know the the pms and everything like that they'll want you to do it more with the joel but we haven't done it yet and i don't think we've seen any ill effects from not doing it as often great um do we have another question so is it possible to set up multi-hole multi-shot setup for the microscope what's the throughput for images that you get per hour and per day uh, yes, it is possible with Serial EM, um, and it depends on the settings that you use, it depends on the grid, that, the grid that you have, things like that, but you can definitely push it to 10,000 images per day on this microscope. In this microscope, the CryoArm 200 actually does not have fringe-free imaging yet, and I know that it is available on some CryoArms. Ours doesn't have it yet, so even without the fringe-free imaging, we can get to 10,000 images per day if we really push it. But with fringe free imaging, I believe that on the CryoArm 300, I believe they get over 20,000 images per day. Nice. We have another question. Are the highest resolution collections that you show in your presentation, were they obtained with CDS or non-CDS counted mode? And have you found that CDS mode is necessary to achieve the highest resolutions? 
for the high resolution stuff, it was done with CDS. That was actually one of the differences with BetaGal was that the 1.8 angstrom structure was not done with CDS, and the 1.6 angstrom structure was done with CDS. I don't have any general conclusions to draw, but we always collect with CDS now, so we we don't have any objective comparison. But I do believe it helps. Great. We have another question about water molecules. The water molecules could freeze at such low temperatures. Uh, doesn't it distort the structure of the protein? Not if we do it properly. If we if we plunge freeze in ethane and it's cold enough, then the, the cooling should be fast enough that it won't be a problem. Great. And we have several questions about throwboard again. You have already uh, addressed them. We have another question, uh, which is, for, as for a ribosome data set, are those with thin carbon film or just particles in ice? Just particles in ice. And there's another question about prior arm. How often do you have to flash the tip on the cryo arm system that you have? So we have it set up to flash every four hours, and that seems to keep it stable over the course of the data collection session. We haven't tried to push that too much, but we use four hours. And I know that in the, the new cryo arm, the cryo arm too, they've improved the vacuum system such that they can go longer. I don't know the exact time, but longer than four hours. Let's see. And there's another question. Do you have some data about sub 100 kilodalton proteins? Uh, nothing to show right now, unfortunately, and uh, you know, hopefully soon, but nothing to show as far as high resolution stuff. Another question about seems like it's uh, beam induced damage. Uh, what happens to the hydrogens at higher doses, electron dosage? Yeah, so they, I read this paper from Garib where they, they do are believed to disappear. We do see them a little bit better in the lower dose maps, but the difference is not as stark as I was expecting. So for the beta got ones that were shown here, those are from 40 angstroms. We haven't yet tried some of the lower doses, but with the ribosome, Yana's played around with using different uh, portions of the dose, and the ones that I showed here were from 20 electron dose. So that seems to be a good area right there, but we haven't seen as much variation with the doses I was expecting. Great. So for the sake of time, I think this will be the last question. Again, uh, there are several other questions popping out. So we'll be sending the answers to the questions by emails. But last question, Alan, uh, how much time did it take you to set up Cerulean for your cryo arm system? Cerulean, the way it's set up right now, it goes very, very quickly. You can easily get data collection started within minutes, actually. It just depends on how many squares you want to select. That's the big limiting step. So if you have 100 squares, it might take 10 minutes for the, the program to take that. But other than that, it's almost immediate, very fast. All right, with that, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you everyone for attending the Life Sciences webinar today. You have a great day.